A sister in Messiah Yeshua on Facebook posted this status. What does the scripture teach us when we're betrayed by a friend? And I replied, hmm, that would be a great and valuable study. Very relevant too. So that very day, I set out to study betrayal and what the scripture says about betrayal. Now, first off, betray, betray is defined as, number one, to give aid or information to an enemy of, to commit treason against. Number two, to inform upon or deliver into the hands of an enemy in violation of trust or allegiance. And number three, to be false or disloyal to. We could see scriptural examples uh, for all of these. Now, let's take the first one, for example, to give aid or information to an enemy of, commit treason against. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, when David is on the run from King Saul and he goes to the priests and retrieves uh, Goliath's sword, it talks about how Doeg, an Edomite, was there. And later, David would reveal that he had suspicions about this guy, that this guy was going to uh, betray him or uh, turn him into Saul. And that's exactly what he did. And as a result, many Levitical priests lost their lives uh, because uh, Doeg uh, you know, was, 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 was giving information to King Saul regarding David and his whereabouts and his activity. Now, number two, it says to inform upon or deliver into the hands of an enemy in violation of trust or allegiance. Judas, thou betray the son of man with a kiss? Need I say more? Judas was a trusted disciple of Messiah Yeshua. And of course, uh, he uh, turned Yeshua over for 30 pieces of silver. And this is a perfect example of that. To inform upon or deliver into the hands of an enemy, that's exactly what Judas did with, with Jesus. He, he handed them over to the enemy and got paid for it in violation of trust or allegiance. You know, he, he, he spoke out of both sides of his mouth. He, he, he wanted to act like that, that, that he pledged his loyalty and allegiance to his rabbi, to Yeshua. Um, and, and Yeshua trusted him. Um, and that trust was betrayed. All right, number three, to be false or disloyal to. Now, one example comes to mind is uh, when Absalom killed his brother Amnon under false pretense, acting like, oh, what you did to my sister is, is long forgotten, everything's fine, come to this party, enjoy the celebration with me. And when the guy got drunk, Absalom turned on him and killed him uh, to be false or disloyal to. He was false to Amnon. And so these are some uh, very brief and quick, off the, off the cuff, off the top of my head, scriptural examples regarding uh, the definition of the word betray. Now, I want to take you to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And this is what the Lord hates. It says, the Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. The King James says, and an abomination. Now, this word abomination is to'eva, and it means a disgust, a loathsome, and abhorrent thing. So, it says, the Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are abominable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, and a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Each one of those verses has a component of betrayal within them. In other words, you can do one or all of those things to another person and it be considered betrayal. Now, let's go back all the way to the beginning. Let's go back to Adam and Eve in uh, the Garden of Eden. So in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 15 through 17, it reads, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free. 
to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, this passage reveals Adam's uh, pledge and allegiance to God by A, cultivating and guarding the garden. So we see that Adam is loyal to God, that he's pledged his allegiance to God, that he is submitted in obedience to God by cultivating and guarding the garden. Verse 15 says, uh, the Lord God took man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it, that's cultivating it, and to watch over it. That Hebrew word to watch over it means to guard it, guard it from enemies, guard it from, uh, you know, what have you. So A, uh, Adam was loyal to God. Uh, because he was cultivating and guarding the garden which God placed him in and given him manage, uh, managerial jurisdiction and authority over. B, we see that Adam obeyed God's commands. He was obedient to God. God said in verses 16 and 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, and because the fall hadn't occurred yet, we're safe to assume that Adam obeyed, right? So it says, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. So Adam was doing that. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. So we see that Adam was in obedience uh, um, to God in this respect. Now, betrayal occurred when Eve, with Adam's complicity, disobeyed God and obeyed the enemy. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now the serpent was, more, was most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So here we see that Adam was complicit in Eve's act of treason against God. God is, God is the king. He's the one who sets the kingdom law. He laid out the kingdom law for Adam and Eve. They committed treason by disobeying the king and breaking the royal command and siding and believing with the enemy, the serpent. And so, um, so we see that God was betrayed by Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve betrayed God by, number one, disobeying God, and number two, by obeying the enemy himself. So how did God respond to the betrayal? And to answer that, we have to go to the rest of the chapter of Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 24. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all this, but basically to answer the question, how did God respond to betrayal? We find the answers in the text that I just mentioned. The answer is he responded to betrayal in mercy, in mercy, instead of instantaneous death, which is in all reality what Adam and Eve deserved. So we read in chapter 2, verse 7, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, they did die spiritually immediately because they were separated from their personal relationship with God. And they began, they began to die physically. So it was a slow death. It was a slow process of death. It wasn't an, in, an instantaneous physical death. So how did God respond to betrayal? He responded in mercy. By A, allowing the process of mortal death to begin instead of it being instantaneous, and B, doling out consequences for actions, basically having the punishment fit the crime, and C, he showed mercy by, one, allowing them to live, two, covering their shame by introducing a system of repentance and salvation via a substitutionary death. And we find this. 
in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And it says, The Lord made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. So they were naked, they were ashamed of the fact, and so they were skins. Now we're not talking skins of grapes. We're talking animal skins. Some innocent animal had to die in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed, in order for their sin to be atoned for, to be covered. So blood had to be shed for this process to happen. Most likely, it was a sheep or a goat. It was a sheepskin or a goat skin. So, um, you know, covering their shame by introducing repentance and salvation via a substitutionary death. And again, 321, the Lord made clothing for skin, of skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. Okay, and lastly, God showed mercy to Adam and Eve by actually kicking them out of the garden. You're saying, whoa, wait, wait, how's that merciful? If he was merciful, wouldn't he let them stay? No, 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 listen, hear me out. It was the most loving act God could do by kicking them out of the Garden of Eden. Why? Let's go to chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. God, the Lord God said, since man has become like one of us, speaking, referring us, referring to the Godhead, but also us in referring to the unfallen angelic hosts, the divine council, if you will. Then the Lord God said, since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. That would have been a big old mess because they've already taken from the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means that they, they, are, they now live in a fallen state where they're spiritually dead and physically on their way to death by the process of dying. So if they ate from the tree of life, they would be eternally separated from God because of their fallen state, because of their sin. And they would live forever. It would almost be like dying forever. So it was the most merciful thing God could do to kick them out of the garden. So it says, the Lord God said, since man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away <clears throat> from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed cherubim and flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way of the Tree of Life. So we see that God, uh, he, he, act, he, he responded to betrayal by number one, uh, you know, forgiving, but yet still doling out consequences and showing mercy. Now, in short, we could say God forgave, but he didn't forget. You've heard that saying, forgive and forget. No, if you forget what has been forgiven, then that same action will be done unto you and you'll be you'll continually be hurt in the same way it, it, it goes along the same lines as <clears throat> you know those who 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 do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it so in short god forgave but he didn't forget not that he not in not forgetting that he held it against adam and eve no they were forgiven but he never forgot that but he did forgive them okay now let's go to genesis chapter 33 and we'll um uh, discuss another instance of betrayal. All right, Jacob and Esau, siblings, brother against brother, um, a long sordid history of tit for tat betrayal on both parties, on both Jacob's part and Esau's part. So we're not going to rehash all that past history. All we know at this point is that Esau has always been out for Jacob. He has always plotted and planned and schemed, and he was seeking some way to find Jacob, get a hold of Jacob, and kill him for what Jacob did to him. So Jacob forgave his brother Esau for seeking to kill him, but apparently still had reason not to fully trust Esau. So Jacob cuts off the relationship, but remains civil. Now, a lot of people think that in order to forgive somebody, you have to have reconciliation for that forgiveness to be legit and complete. No, you can forgive someone without forgetting what they've done. You can forgive someone without reconciliation. You may be willing to reconcile, but maybe the other person isn't. And you can't help that. So in Genesis chapter 33, it says, Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him 
with 400 men. That doesn't sound good. Knowing Esau, it didn't sound like a welcoming party to Jacob. It sounded like a war party. Now, Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two, two slave women. Okay, so we're going to skip a lot of this uh, because basically uh, Jacob is trying to win Esau's favor, butter him up, give him a bunch of gifts of flocks and herds, valuables, etc., in hopes that it'll soften Esau up enough that he spares the life or the lives of himself as well as his, as his wives, the handmaids, and all of his children. So, um, verse 8. So Esau said, okay, so Esau's in Jacob's presence. So he says, what do you mean by this whole procession I met? To find favor with you, my lord, he answered. Oh, I have enough, my brother, Esau replied. Keep what you have. But Jacob said, no, 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 please. If I have found favor with you, take these gifts from me. For indeed, I have seen your face as like seeing the face of God, since you have accepted me. Please take my present <clears throat> that was brought to you, because God has been gracious to me, and I have everything that I need. So Jacob urged him until he accepted. So this accepting of these gifts was a Middle Eastern tradition and sort of like a legal contract that it was like a peace treaty. Okay, if you accept these gifts, then that means by accepting these gifts, you've forgiven me for what I've done to you. So uh, then it says in verse 12, then Esau said, let's move on and I'll go ahead of you. Uh, so Jacob replied, my Lord knows that the children are weak and I have nursing flocks and herds. If they are driven hard for one day, the whole herd will die. Let my Lord go ahead of his servant and I will continue on slowly at a pace suited to the livestock and children until I come to you, my Lord, at Seir. So basically, with Esau accepting the gifts, another expectation was that Jacob was to go back to Esau's territory and have a meal in his honor. And this meal would kind of seal this peace deal or this peace treaty. But apparently, he didn't fully trust Esau. Maybe there was something in his demeanor or his actions or just that funny feeling in his gut that something isn't right. So he did not fully trust. He did not see fruit from Esau enough to trust him. Did Jacob forgive him? Yes, I believe absolutely he forgiven him. But because you forgive somebody doesn't mean that you trust them. And you're not expected to trust them if they have not proven themselves enough for you to trust them. So it says in verse 15, Esau said, let me leave some of my people with you. Red flag, fishy, fishy, fishy. So Jacob replied, why do that? Please indulge me, my Lord. He's thinking these people are he's going to leave behind to keep tabs on me and turn on me and kill me. Verse 16, that day Esau started on his way back to Seir, but Jacob went to Sukkoth. Jacob turned around and went the other way. He did not go back with Esau. He did not trust Esau. He forgave Esau, but he did not trust him. Therefore, reconciliation wasn't made because he didn't feel that there was in, in, an ability for reconciliation because he didn't fully trust Esau for whatever reason. So it says that that day Esau started back on his way to Seir, but Jacob went to Sukkoth. He built a house for himself and, sh and shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from, uh, okay, we'll just, we'll just stop right there. All right. So we see that basically, for all intents and purposes, Jacob cuts total relational ties with Esau. He's still his brother. He still loves him. He's forgiven him. But he sees no need to continue a chummy, buddy-buddy relationship with Esau because he believes Esau uh, is toxic. And that's not good for him, nor good for his family. It could put them in further danger. But we learn another rule in uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse, verses 27 and 28. So as, as well as we know, from that point on, Jacob and Esau never spoke to each other again, never crossed paths. The next time they met was to bury their father, which teaches us that even though you've forgiven, and yet there's no reconciliation or relationship that you still should remain civil when circumstances dictate that you have to be in each other's presence. It says, Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, 
where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. His sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Both buried the hatchet and were civil long enough to bury their father. And then again, they go their separate ways and we don't really, you know, hear any more from them. All right, so that's another example in regards to betrayal and what the scripture says we need to do with betrayal. This gives us permission that if there is no possibility of reconciliation, it's totally and perfectly fine to totally cut off ties and relations with that person. You still forgive them, you still love them, but you don't open up yourself to be hurt by them anymore. If there's no chance of reconciliation, if the person has not shown fruit, uh, that they're sincere. Um, all right, let's move on. All right, let's go to David. King David. All right, let's go to the Psalms and, and, and uh, check out betrayal in regards to the Psalms. So Psalm 41, Psalm 41, verse 9 says this. Even my friend in whom I trusted, one who ate my bread. That is a euphemism in Hebrew, meaning fellowship. When you eat at somebody's table, it means that your friends, your family, you're at peace. You have a treaty. So it says, even my friend whom I trusted, one who ate my bread, has raised his heel against me. You know, like if somebody flipped you the bird, that would be highly offensive. Well, in the Middle Eastern culture, if you show somebody's heel, show you their heel, it's kind of the equivalent of flipping somebody off. It wasn't taken too kindly. It was a euphemism for betrayal or for hate. And actually, Psalm 41.9 is actually a messianic psalm because this psalm is quoted in relation to when Judas betrayed Jesus. When Judas, when, and Jesus said, the one who betrays me is the one who's going to dip his bread in the dish with me. Right? You remember that at the Passover? So this is, this is the fulfillment of that messianic prophecy in Psalm uh, 41.9. Even my friend whom I trusted. One who ate my bread has raised his heel against me. So David here is addressing betrayal. But if we go to Psalm, Psalm 35, Psalm 35 verses 11 through 14 shows us how David dealt with such betrayal. Psalm 35 verse 11 says, malicious witnesses come forward. They question me about things I do not know. They repay me evil for good. In other words, I've been betrayed. I've been nothing but good to them. And they're rep repaying my good with evil. They repay me evil for good, making me desolate. And this is how he deals with such betrayal. Verse 13. Yet when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. And I humbled myself with fasting. And my prayer was genuine. I went about mourning as if for my friend or brother. I was bowed down with grief. Like one mourning for a mother. So David said, look, I not only forgave them for their betrayal, when they were down on their luck, when they were being punished, or when they were sick or in dire straits, I didn't gloat, I didn't laugh, I didn't say, serves you right, I didn't say, told you so. He said, no, I put on sackcloth and ashes and I prayed and fasted for them, that God would be merciful to him, that God, that God would heal them. And this goes right along with what Yeshua himself said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 48. Well, let's start with verse 43, all right? It says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It says that David was a man after God's own heart. And Yeshua is saying what David did. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And, and see, tax collectors were considered betrayers themselves. They've betrayed the Jewish people. They betrayed their faith to fall in league with the Roman government and persecute their own people and tax them into oblivion. So they were considered betrayers. But it says, don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you only greet your brother and sister, what, what are you doing that's out of the ordinary? Don't even Gentiles, non-Hebrews, non-Jews do the same? 
Be perfect. Be complete, in other words. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, is complete. Now, I also remind you what Yeshua said from the cross. Everybody, just days and weeks before, were following him, wanting to make him king, wanting to make him Messiah. And yet these very same people were at the, at, at, at the, at the trial and saying, crucify him, crucify him. They're the very ones who just days ago, weeks ago, were saying, be our king. And now they are jeering him, looking at him as he hangs up on the bloody cross. And Yeshua said, regarding these people who betrayed him in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They have no idea what they're doing. They have no clue. They truly do not fully comprehend what they're doing. Now, let's go to Job. We know Job, the patience of Job, the sickness of Job, how Job lost everything, his health, his wealth, his family, everything. But his friends betrayed him. They're like, wait, wait, wait a second, how did they betray him? They, they sat with him and, 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 and mourned for seven days with him. They counseled him. He said, what miserable comforters you are, because they questioned Job's integrity, threw Job under the bus and saying, obviously, this has all happened to you because maybe somehow, some way you've offended God and you've sinned. Job's like, no, I swear I haven't done anything. I'm totally innocent. Yeah, right, Job. Why else would this be happening? Well, God finally has the final say. And Job chapter 42, starting with verse 7, says, After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliaphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls, seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer a burnt offering for yourself. Then my servant Job will pray for you. In order for Job to pray for his friends, he had to forgive them, right? So forgiveness is key when you are being betrayed. Then my servant Job will pray for you, and I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. Again, another aspect of, of, of biblically responding, responding to betrayal in a godly way is forgiveness and mercy. God says, I'm not going to do to you what you deserve. I'm going to be merciful to you. For you have not spoken truth about me. In other words, you haven't just betrayed Job. You betrayed me by speaking lies about me. As my, uh, for you have not spoken truth about me as my servant Job has. Then Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nemeathite went and did as the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. All right. Let's end this with talking about Peter and Judas. Oh yeah, we always throw Judas under the bus because he betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss, right? He betrayed Messiah Yeshua for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. But did not Peter betray Jesus in the exact same way? I mean, he didn't betray him for money. He betrayed him out of fear. I mean, with, with Peter saying three times, I don't know the man, blankety blank, I don't know the man. I don't know what you're talking. I don't know him. Before the cock crows, you will, be, you will deny me three times. Peter betrayed Jesus just as Judas betrayed Jesus. Same sin, different outcome. Judas couldn't live with himself. He hung himself, committed suicide. Peter said, I'm washed up. I'm not worthy to be a Talmudim, a disciple of Rabbi Yeshua. So I'm going to go fishing. It's the only thing I know to do. I'm going back to my old trade. But we see that Jesus forgives Peter. And so here's the last step in regards to betrayal. Now, this step won't always happen because with Jacob and Esau, there was no restoration. There couldn't be any restoration. But if restoration is possible, you forgive, you be merciful, and you restore. You forgive, you be merciful, and you restore. So let's turn to John chapter 21, starting with verse 15. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Shimon Kepha, Simon, son of John. Okay, we know that Peter's name means rock. He was the son of John. So if Peter was alive today, his name would be Rocky Johnson. Rocky, son of John, Johnson, Johnson's, John's son, Rocky Johnson. Little joke there. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. And a second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love me? Now, we know why Jesus did that, right? Because Peter denied him three times. Yeshua was forgiving him three times and restoring him. He says, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. So, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would glorify God. We know by history and tradition, Peter was crucified upside down. Because Peter said, if you're going to crucify me, I can't be crucified in the same way as my Lord was. I'm unworthy of that. Crucify me upside down. So it says after this, he said, he said, to, he said this to him. He told him, follow me. So we have forgiveness, mercy, and restoration, if possible. So remember Jacob and Esau, it's not always possible. But mercy and forgiveness is always possible. Restoration depends on the other party, how they respond. Peter responded. You know, he accepted the Lord's forgiveness and he accepted the Lord's uh, attempts to restore him. And as a result, we see that Peter didn't go back to his fishing nets as he intended to do. Instead, Peter, uh, you know, in Acts, Acts chapter 2 became, you know, one of the, the big church leaders and, 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 and led many to the Lord in, in, in a revival and thousands upon thousands got saved. And that was because he was restored. All right, so this was a very short and brief study on betrayal. I hope it's really helped you. Thanks for listening. Shalom and God bless.